This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. World-class orthopedic surgeon, Dr. James Andrews on this edition of Conversations. When elite professional athletes have orthopedic injuries, often the first call is to Dr. James Andrews. Dr. Andrews is at the pinnacle of sports medicine. He has saved or revived the careers of some of the biggest names in sports. His patient list is athletic royalty. Names like Drew Brees, Emmett Smith, Bo Jackson, John Smoltz, Jack Nicholas, and Charles Barkley are just a few. Top athletes aren't the only ones who benefit from Dr. Andrews' skills. Many patients are ordinary people, more at home behind a desk than behind center. Dr. Andrews also spends a good deal of his time crusading against preventable injuries in youth sports. Dr. James Andrews is founding partner and medical director of the Andrews Institute, and we are pleased to have him on this edition of Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Jeff. That's uh, quite a flattering introduction. But I must admit, uh, my wife reminds me quite frequently that if I'm still talking about what I did yesterday, I'm not doing much today. But it is a pleasure to be with you. It is absolutely a, a pleasure to have you. I do, if you don't mind, I, I do want to go back a few years and talk a little bit about your past. What was it that got you into the medical field? Well, you know, it sort of happened. I think if you, if you try to plan your life, sometimes uh, you can go astray. Uh, you got to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, it just happened that I was sitting in the lap of my grandfather who wanted to be a doctor himself. And he did what we call plant the seed, which, by the way, is a very important thing to do with young kids. He planted the seed when he would rock me when I was a young kid. He said, you're going to be my doctor when you grow up. So my whole, whole life was geared toward one profession, and uh, uh, it's worked out pretty well for me. I, I would say it has. Any particular reason why orthopedics? Well, sports was big in my life. My father was a college football player. All of our social family life was, was built around sports in high school. Uh, I went to LSU on a, uh, as a pole vaulter and track scholarship. So when I finished uh, pre-med in, in, in LSU, I went to LSU Medical School, and I wanted to be a team physician. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be involved in sports. Uh, uh, that was sort of my compromise. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I finished up my actual sporting career, I said, well, what, what's next best? That's sports medicine. Right. So uh, I got into sports medicine uh, as I finished uh, my residency and did a couple of fellowships and worked with uh, a man named Jack Houston in Columbus, Georgia. Many of our viewers uh, remember that famous name. He was the team physician for Auburn. And he taught me a lot of uh, things about um, uh, my profession and brought me along. And, and uh, everything else is basic history for me. What was the turning point? When did you become sort of the go-to guy for professional athletes? Was there one particular moment? You know, uh, the two keys that really allow you to do what I've done uh, in any profession, uh, number one, uh, uh, taking care of people. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, 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 we're providers for people. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Communication and availability is what really got me into sports. Uh, I, I always made myself available. Uh, if you look back at some of my signature patients uh, that sort of uh, picked me out for either as friends or acquaintances, uh, one comes to mind here in this Pensacola area is Jerry Pate. Mm -hmm. I operated on Jerry soon after he won the U.S. Open. Next thing I know, he had Jack Nicholas coming to see me. Uh, I, I got involved with baseball players. I operated on Roger Clemens early yeah. on in his career, and you know what a great career he Absolutely. had. Absolutely. Bo Jackson, on and on and on. Um, I took care of a lot of high school kids. High school kids became college players. College players all of a sudden became pro players, mm -hmm. and it grew from there. Now I'm taking care of, grand, uh, of people that I operated on and taking care of their grandkids, so I'm still going. <laughs> you, you're still going. You, you've been at the pinnacle of metal. Why are you continuing to work? Well, you know, um, uh, you know I, I have an old saying that says if you enjoy what you do and, and you do what you love, you'll always be successful. And I, I really enjoy what I do. I mean, it's fun. I, I, I'm excited every morning when I get up. Uh, sometimes I'm, I'm worried about how I'm going to get through the day. Yeah. 
which is normal, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm still stimulated. I'm still listening and learning, and uh, I still work hard. And uh, if I don't work hard, I, I probably wouldn't wouldn't last very long. So it, it's a it's a it's a way of life. Uh, I don't intend to to slow down at all. Somebody asked me the other day. They said, uh, uh, "Do you do you feel old?" And I said, "Well." The only time I feel old is when I look in the mirror. So what did I do? I quit looking in the mirror. <laughs> so, you know, I think you have to stay young. You have to stay stimulated in life, and uh, it keeps you young. What's your favorite part about the job? The satisfaction that I see in, in a patient, uh, and it may be somebody that uh, had a bad rotator cuff tear that's a, a local tennis player at the tennis facility, and, and to see him... For example, out socially and him come up to me and say, hey, I'm back playing tennis, my right shoulder, you've operated on twice and I can still play. Then, of course, then you go to the other level. Uh, I was watching Drew Brees uh, play weekend before last. I think it was Monday night football or Sunday night, one of the two. He was on fire. Mm -hmm. uh, he's better now than, than the first year he came back after the, the complicated surgery I did on his shoulder. Uh, all of those things are rewarding. Mm -hmm. uh, it, Medicine for all doctors is really a rewarding profession. Uh, people appreciate what you do. You're able to do things to help people. Uh, you're constantly stimulated uh, by uh, complicated situations. I tell uh, young fellows and trainees with me that there's never a, a, an, an orthopedic case that we do that's routine. Every mm -hmm. one of them's got something special that stimulates you. So uh, that's the beauty and, and the joy of medicine. I've always been curious, what is it, what skills are there that make a great surgeon? You know, you have to have compassion for patients. As I said, medicine is a people business. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you just separate yourself from the people that you take care of and you don't show compassion, um, you're not going to be a very good doctor. It's not the technical aspects of what you do in the operating room. It's the how you respond to some patient's problem. It's how you relate to them. It's how you talk to them. Uh, you don't necessarily have to talk to them precisely about their their particular medical problem. You have to talk to them. Well, I remember uh, your granddad that I, I operated on 30 years ago. How's Uncle So and So doing? Uh, what type of work do you do? Tell me about your career. Uh, it's the personal relationship that you develop on a one-on-one -on -one basis that really makes you successful in medicine, in any specialty yeah. of medicine. And any business for that oh, matter. Well, as I said, people. Yeah. We're, we're people. I, I guess the patient, when they feel comfortable with you, they have a better attitude, and that certainly has to help in the rehabilitative process, I would think. Yeah, the other key, of course, is, uh, is a positive attitude for patients. You've got to give them hope. Yeah. You have to be truthful with them, and a lot of doctors don't understand that. They'll, you know, they'll 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 paint the the bad picture. Uh, well, gosh, you've got this, that, and the other, and and it, and and we'd probably I don't know if we can fix this or not. The glass is half empty; it's not half full. You have to be truthful with them. You have to give them the facts. But if you're smart enough and you handle it properly, you'll always finish with. We're going to get you well, though. We're going to right. take care of you right. and leave that positive thought in their mind right at the very end of your conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd be amazed how that positive thought and that confidence that you give them just with that one little finishing sentence to give them some idea. It's going to be a challenge, but don't worry. We're going to get you well. Right. And that, that means a lot to patients. Over your years, what has the, the biggest change from a technology standpoint been? Oh, I mean, that happens every day. Or the biggest difference maker, maybe a better, a better question. Well, the, 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 the thing that revolutionized uh, sports medicine, it trickled down into all aspects of orthopedics and now into lots of, of the surgical specialties, was the arthroscope. That was the big revolution, the big revelation mm -hmm. uh, back in the early 70s. And I was fortunate enough to come along, I said, that the, being at the right place at the right time, and I was an early pioneer in, in the use of the arthroscope in, in, in orthopedics. And, of course, that fed right into minimally invasive surgery for, for sports medicine injuries. Uh, we learned a lot on, with our relationship with uh, high-level elite athletes. But that, that fed right down to the ordinary patients that, are, that have an active lifestyle. But the arthroscope 
was the big thing. We keep looking for the next big revelation. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> uh, but the, the arthroscope is still the king of, of, of what's happened in, in our specialty. One of the procedures you're known for doing a lot of is the Tommy John surgery. First of all, what is it? Well, it's a procedure uh, to reconstruct the stabilizing ligament. You know, when you throw a baseball, you're way out here, tremendous stress mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. your elbow. That ligament goes from bone to bone across the elbow joint, and it's a very fragile ligament. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when a young high school kid throws a baseball at 85 miles per hour, he's near the red line of tearing that ligament. Red mm -hmm. line meaning like your RPMs on your automobile right. engine. He's at the red line of tearing that ligament on every pitch. All he has to do is be a little bit off. A little bit, fatigue is a big factor, cold night, uh, uh, lots of innings, lots of pitches, and boom, here goes his ligament. So that ligament is fragile, but it's a stabilizer across the elbow to prevent your elbow from opening up. So it's the, it's the Tommy John's ligament named after, of course, a very famous pitcher who had the first procedure, his name was Tommy Johns, right. when he pitched for the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers. I read something that you had said that so many of your patients now are, as you mentioned, high school and, and, and youth athletes that are coming in and, and are having to have the surgery, and you said that shouldn't be happening. Well, we're inundated. Uh, you know, we live in the Sunshine State, right? <laughs> uh, and you may could expect a lot of youth injuries uh, from year-round sports in the state of Florida, but now we're seeing them come in from South Dakota, uh, Connecticut. Uh, these kids are all playing year-round sports and they're specializing in one sport. So they're playing baseball, for example, year-round. And since year 2000, for example, at our research institute here in Pensacola at the Andrews Institute, uh, we've seen a five to seven fold increase in injuries in youth sports across the board. So we're seeing an epidemic, almost an, in epidemic proportions, young kids in high school age and younger getting hurt. And they're getting hurt with injuries that used to be unique to older athletes. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing young kids with adult type injuries uh, in sports that are serious injuries uh, and, and of course my passion in the twilight of my career is trying to get involved in prevention of those injuries and trying to get these kids healthy. Our motto is is to try to keep them out of the operating room and on the playing field. You can imagine how important it is sports is to our society right. and how, how important it is to for me to keep them playing and, and, and how, how much I enjoy sports and enjoy kids being able to participate in sports, but the injuries are are staggering now. I know you've started a program about stopping injuries. Expand right. on that a little bit. When I was president two years ago of the American Orthopedic Society of Sports Medicine, that's our national organization of team physicians. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I'd been trying to get this done for about ten years, but I was able to start a program called the Stop Program. STOP is an acronym for Sports Trauma and Overuse Prevention STOP in Youth Sports. So that's a national initiative and we have a website I would ask all of your viewers, your parents, your grandparents, the coaches, the kids to go to and it's www.stopsportsinjuries.org, www.stopsportsinjuries.org. And we've got a website on there that gives a, a lot of grassroots information, just common sense tips about prevention of injuries in some 25 youth sports. A very, very important national initiative across the country. A couple of things that parents should be aware of, a couple of things parents should be doing when their child is participating in sports. What? Well, there are two, two buzzwords. One is specialization. Mm -hmm. That means participating in one sport year-round. And I mean competing in one right. sport basically year-round. Right. The other word is professionalism. That is taking a kid 10 years old and trying to make a professional athlete out of him. Now, there have been some professional athletes that have been able to do that, but they had the one in a million genetic makeup to be able to do that. Right. I mean, most of our kids get burnt out, they get injured. And so professionalism at a young age uh, is, is, is a problem. The, the biggest factor 
when you think about those two words, mm -hmm. the biggest factor in, in injuries in youth sports is still fatigue. We did a research study that showed and peer-reviewed and published that if you threw a baseball, for example, under fatigue conditions, there was a 36 to 1 times that you could injure your shoulder or your elbow. Wow. 36 to 1. So fat fatigue can be described in youth baseball, for example, as event fatigue. That's too many pitches. That's why we, I, I started the pitch count in Little League. Mm -hmm. Too many pitches in one game. That's event fatigue. The next type of fatigue is uh, seasonal fatigue. That means too many innings in a season. And then the other type of fatigue is year-round fatigue. Right, right. Where they're playing and competing in a sport year-round. So those three types of fatigue are, are something you have to think about or your kid's going to get hurt. Any recommendation, for example, a rule of thumb as, as far as how many pitches? Well, we've got pitch counts that they can certainly go back and look up uh, for different ages uh, uh, from 9 and 10 all the way up into the high school, and that's on our website, uh, and you can get that through Little League. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the major thing is... Uh, is understanding uh, the, the, the number of months that you should be able to rest from, from a Pacific sport. Right. And that, that we recommend three to four months okay. off, at least two months off from a Pacific sport. And we also recommend that you shouldn't really specialize in a Pacific sport until you're at least a senior in high school. Okay. If you take some of the superstars today, some of the young super, superstars like Sam Bradford, who was playing on football on on football, a Monday night football last night, he played four sports until he was a senior in high school. Then he specialized in, in as a quarterback in football. Mm -hmm. uh, John Smoltz played several four sports all the way through high school. So you want to cross train so your body has a, a tendency to recover, mm -hmm. but you need rest from a Pacific sport three to four months each year. Speaking of training, it, it, what's a good age that youth athletes should start? "Quote unquote training," and I'm not just talking about participating in t-ball or pony league or something like that, but getting sort of serious about training. Well, you know, uh, you can train at a very early age. Uh, you know, we used to say that you shouldn't weight lift until you went through puberty and your bone structures matured, but you can do light strength training when you're uh, young. There's nothing wrong with that. There, there, there. Flexibility training that we can do, their 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 uh, their specific training that we do for prevention, such as the different exercises. We have a program we're going to start here in, in Pensacola. We tried to get it started this summer, but we are ho we, we're pretty sure we're going to be able to do that this next summer for young kids, uh, particularly our young females who have a high incidence of tearing their ACL, mm -hmm. uh, the main stabilizing ligament of the knee. And there's a prevention program where we teach them how to jump and how to be flexible and how to land. And that program can help prevent injuries uh, to the ACL, uh, which has a staggering number of injuries, obviously. Young females, by the way, in soccer, basketball, uh, volleyball, all the cutting sports, they, are about a, they have about a 5 to 1 ratio of tearing their anterior cruciate ligament at a young age compared to males. So the prevention programs that we're trying to get done in this community can help prevent those injuries. So there are a number of exercises you can do to teach people balance, mm -hmm. flexibility, and how to jump and land properly Broken. without tearing their knee up. Any particular reason why girls are more prone than boys? Well, there's a number of theories. Uh, you know, Title IX is, is, is going to help as we get further along with girls participating at an early age. You'll probably see it... Uh, the injury rates equalize, but uh, the shape of the pelvis in a female is a little different. The knee comes down at more of a, of a knock knee angle. Uh, there are other theories that people are trying to theorize. There's a lot of research being done now trying to figure that out. We do know that it's higher. Uh, it has to do with body uh, uh, com uh, composition and, and composure and the way the knees are built. And also, uh, uh, 
initially uh, our young female athletes didn't really get into a jumping sport until they were getting ready to get into junior high school. Right. And they hadn't been they hadn't been out in the yard jumping and learning how to land. All of a sudden, they were right, there you are. thrown into basketball or soccer, and here they went with an injury. Yeah. So that's why the reason for these for these summer programs is to get them get them involved in how to land and jump so they won't hurt their knee. Speaking of research at Andrews Institute, I know you do a lot of research. What are some of the things you're working on now? Well, we're we're uh, we're still involved in uh, in in educational programs, number one. We have an education company now that's trying to, to reach out to uh, parents, coaches, uh, and, and, and we put that all once a month on the internet. So education is a big aspect of what we do there. And then you get in, into research. Uh, we're still studying uh, the, the biomechanics of the pitching motion. Right now, one of the studies that's sort of unique and specific is we're seeing college and pro players come in with what they call a, a hard change-up. They're throwing a change-up in the 85 miles per hour range and they're doing it in a specific way and they're now coming in. Change-up was supposed to be the safe pitch right. for everybody. They're coming in tearing their alternate collateral ligament. So we're studying that in our biomechanics lab. Uh, we're still doing a lot of, of research uh, directly related to uh, trying to, to, to have a registry where we actually will be able to take kids that come in with youth injuries and we can we have a form we're filling out on youth injuries that will tell us when they got hurt what was the risk factor so we can document in a registry fashion and, and learn why they got hurt if we can learn why they got hurt then we can perhaps change things to to correct that and then we then the last step of that research is to go do the follow-up to see if the things that we learned, that we changed, whether or not doing interventions actually decrease the injury rate. So it's real complicated to be able to do the proper research to be able to change rules, for example. Yeah. We did that, as I told you. We did that in, uh, in youth baseball, and the uh, uh, USA Baseball helped us with that, which is the governing body for all of, of amateur baseball. And we then were able to uh, uh, pass that to Little League International, which I'm on their board, mm -hmm. and we changed the rules for a pitch count. Uh, we also changed rules recently with research we did here at the Andrews Institute relative to a risk factor of uh, a youth baseball player being the, probably the best athlete. Mm -hmm. So what do they do with him? He's the pitcher and the catcher. Right. He actually changes from being the catcher to the pitcher in the same game or the pitcher to the catcher. So he's constantly throwing the baseball, and so his injury rate was high. So we were able to change the rules this last couple of years so that you can't go from being the pitcher to the catcher in the same game. And last year we changed it so you can't go from the catcher to the pitcher in the that same game. And that's all to, done to protect these young kids. Yeah, man. So parents and coaches don't need to try to make a superstar out of their well, teenager. Some parents are fussing about rules, <laughs> but you know, the, once you can sit down and talk to them, they mean well. Yeah. You know who we really try to get to though? Who's that? We try to get to the grandparents. <laughs> they, seem, <laughs> they seem to get it quicker <laughs> and have some influence over their, over the, the real parents uh -huh. and, and a lot of times over the grandkids. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit a little bit, uh, maybe a little more quicker to, to, to pick up why we're doing this yeah. and don't criticize changing these roles. Yeah. So uh, uh, if you're there and you'll listen to us, we'll try to, we'll try to explain it to you, I promise you. Uh, this is, I want to ask you this, because we're getting short on time in about two minutes, and I know this is a little bit out of your wheelhouse, but, but you work with uh, Alabama, Auburn, and also the Washington Redskins as their, their team doctor. What do you make of all of the brain injuries that are starting to show up in the football players? You know, we've got rules out there to prevent these concussions, and, and fortunately, the, uh, it's, it's trickled down from the NFL. They, they cracked down on it. You saw mm -hmm. last, what was it, Monday night? I saw a fine came down today. One of my patients, Colt McCoy, head-to-head -head contact, and, right. and I, used, I saw it all the time, and, it, and unfortunately, it wasn't called. Right. So we've got to we've got to uh, crack down on prevention, and and now uh, unfortunately uh, the, the rules have come down, and 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 there's so much 
pressure that the diagnosis is being made correctly and early, and, and, you know, and there's no such thing as a ding anymore. If you get a, any idea that a kid's got a concussion, he goes to, off the field to the training room, and he's to, he has to, to be evaluated thoroughly over the next week, and he has to be cleared by a medical personnel before he can go back and play, even in high school. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's another thing we're doing over at our institute. We're working on, a, on, a, on legislation in the state of Florida to enact that rule. Now, and that's, you would say that wouldn't be hard to do, but you'd be surprised how hard it is to get that passed mm -hmm. uh, on a state level, and, uh, even in this state of Florida. Mm -hmm. But concussions uh, are serious situations, and uh, young kids are most vulnerable. That's where they begin. Mm -hmm. They begin with young kids in high school, mm -hmm. in, in junior high. As you look ahead in, in about 60 seconds, where do you see the medical field? How will technology change over the next five to ten years in your judgment? Well, you can see my enthusiasm could go on and on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the coming thing that, that I thought would probably occur during the first day, decade of this new millennium was, bio, was enhancement of biological healing, mm -hmm. G, uh, gene therapy and tissue engineering. Uh, that has to do with stem cell therapy. Uh, unfortunately, it still uh, has not happened. Uh, will it happen during this second decade of this new millennium, by year 20, uh, uh, by year 1220? Uh, it's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to do that so that we can uh, enhance the biological healing process, particularly in orthopedic surgery, but in all aspects of medicine. So everybody needs to get behind the research that's needed to, to be able to make sure that stem cell therapy is safe and we know when to use it, how to use it, and uh, we can prove through level one double-blind studies that, it's, if, uh, that it has uh, uh, its own purpose and, and, and its own qualifications for use. Mm. First thing is to make sure it's safe, and the FDA right. is looking after that, fortunately. Can, but that needs to be done in this next during this decade. I mean, that's really important in all aspects of medicine. Dr. James Andrews, we could talk an hour about that. <laughs> Thank you so very much for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Great. Enjoyed being here. Thank you very much. It's been our pleasure. Best of luck to you. Dr. James Andrews from the Andrews Institute. By the way, you can learn more about sports medicine and about the Andrews Institute at theandrewsinstitute.com. You can also see more of our conversations with a wide range of engaging personalities online at wsre.org slash conversations. Just click the episodes button. We greatly appreciate you watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take good care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.